My name is Michael Blum. I'm originally from New Jersey, but the world has been my playground. And I've made my profession out of Hollywood, but have worked all over the world. And I've collected a lot of stories. I love it. And I'm so grateful to be sitting across from you hearing some of the stories. But most importantly, your story. So I want to start by asking you first, what do you think people's first impression of you is? That's interesting. The first impression, well, you never get a second chance at a first impression. So you can kind of tell the way dogs sniff each other out. They kind of know if you're friendly or if you're approachable and, you know, if you don't give off a bad vibe. And I've always looked at myself sort of if I were a mood ring, if you remember mood rings. Uh, yeah. Well, if you're a mood ring, you want to turn people green and blue when they encounter you. And so I make it my goal each day if I can leave somebody with a laugh or a smile or make their day a little better having encountered me, then I've served my purpose. I, I love the vibe of that. So you talked about traveling and everything in your introduction and kind of making your living in Hollywood, but I want to back up first. So let's talk childhood. Where are you from? Originally from New Jersey, but I've, over the course of my life and career, although I based from Hollywood, um, I've lived in Miami, New York, Las Vegas, Singapore, I've worked in Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, Indonesia, Beijing, China, Hong Kong, and I've traveled throughout South America, Brazil, uh, Argentina, uh, all through Europe and uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, my, some of it for work and some of it for the sheer adventure of seeing what is out there in the world. So you've lived nowhere, you've traveled men. Nothing interesting to talk about at all. <laughs> no, very boring, really. Right, right. Mundane. Yeah. Same old day. That would be me. Well, so going back to New Jersey, going back to childhood, did you always want to be in L.A.? Did you always want to be in the entertainment industry? Yes. Really? I knew at a very, very young age. Because, you know, when you're a little kid in, like, kindergarten and first grade, you know, everybody goes, what do you want to be when you grow up? And everybody's like a fireman, a policeman. Some people liked animals. They actually knew they wanted to be a veterinarian. But I wanted to know what the top job was. I mean, who's in charge? What's the best job? So at the time, you know, I, you know, John F. Kennedy was still considered a god, even though he'd been assassinated by then. And I figured president. I mean, that was the top job. You get to tell everybody what to do. So um, then my grandparents informed me that we don't have Jewish presidents. So I said, well, what's the next best thing? And it was producer because it was really about telling stories. We come from a, I come from a family, if not a heritage of people whose whole essence is telling stories. It's carrying around their stories. And we in the entertainment industry are in the storytelling business. And I always knew that, that that motivated me to hear stories, to have my own stories, and to retell them. And, uh, and that's really what I dedicated myself to. But it was combined with an innate ability that growing up in the 70s, which was a very dysfunctional time, women's liberation was happening, uh, there was a lot of divorce, um, drug and alcohol issues, et cetera. And so when you grew up in a kind of a dysfunctional environment, as a kid, you wanted to bring order to the chaos. You wanted to put things and control the logistics, really. Well, guess what? That's what a producer does. They bring order to chaos and chaos to order. And I found at a very young age that, you know, instead of in like the team sports, instead of like on the baseball, whether they, they didn't choose me to be the first baseman or first on the team, they wanted me to be the manager or left out. And I kind of learned that, you know, that I could coordinate things well. And that became my profession was really, you know, coordinating things. And that's what producers do. You talked about the sports and managing the kids' games and getting all of that from a childhood perspective. Was there any of the, okay, kids, let's play this game. Let's film this. Let's act this out. Let's. Yep. The, my first film I ever did, we got a hold of a Super 8 camera. And the Godfather was big. And we decided to do Julius Caesar in the style of the Godfather and called him Little Julie. 
and we dressed up in my parents' clothes and suits, and we went out and shot Julius Caesar as the Godfather. So that was actually one of my first ever productions. How old were you? Oh my God, this must have been around 11, 12, somewhere in there. You know, it's funny, I got to Hollywood, and at the time everybody said, you know, well, what do you really want to do? And they had those t-shirts that said, what I really want to do is direct. And I was like, well, who directs the director? The producer. Oh, okay, I'll be that. But I like that your aspiration was always to be at the top. Yeah, I would say that. I, I really like that. I like that you took ownership and felt empowered to be at the top. Don't know if I quite reached it in the sense that is often used as what is success because I've learned through the ages that it's really not the money. It's not how big your house is. You know, people don't ask, what's your relationship with your kids? You get joy. That's success. Do you have a good marriage or a good relationship with your you know, significant other? That's success. Um, there are other ways to measure it that I think are more important than the way we normally look at it as being on the Forbes top 100 list. We and were having this conversation. You were um, inside getting ready to come and sit down and talk to me. And we were setting up and we had this exact conversation about being the best and what defines the best. And if you don't believe in yourself that you are the best at what you're about to attempt to do, then you're not going to be the best because the best is how you measure it. If you feel that you are accomplishing what you set out to accomplish, then you weren't the best at what you did that day. Well, you might also be the best at failing and sometime you might succeed. But do you agree that if we fail at something, it just leads to a new opportunity? Tell that to Tom Alva Edison. I mean, he failed at many things. Da Vinci yeah. failed at many things and then invented so many more. So you have to be willing to, to fail to succeed, I think. And so let's talk about that. Was there anything, it doesn't have to necessarily be a failure, but was there anything either in your youth or you know, as you were starting out here in Hollywood? So another um, inspiration that affected me greatly, you know, it wasn't so much a failure, but um, at age 14, my body failed. At age 14, out of the blue, they found something in my chest and it turned out to be a cancerous mass. And I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and they removed my spleen. And I was radiated and I, I lost all my hair at 14. It's back. This is mine, not a wig. And that was a really interesting experience to um, face mortality at a very young age and wonder, am I gonna make it to 15 or 20 or 25, 30, 45? And, you know, to be honest, I'll be turning 60 and I'm still here. But what it did was give me an appreciation for every day and wanting to kick my bucket list faster than the average person. That I literally felt that I only have a finite amount of time and heartbeats and I wanna use them productively and I wanted to see the world. I had a list of things I actually wanted to do, and whether it was swim with sharks or climb Mount Everest, and I got to do them. Well, I didn't climb all the way to the top of Mount Everest, but at the same time, I did trek the Himalayas with a Sherpa and a guide and had a facsimile of, of my fantasy as a kid, you know, so that you live close to those encounters. And um, never quite the way you think it's gonna go, but still, it was a, a way to like check off so they have never have any regrets. Um, I actually did a, uh, a piece that I was nominated for a, a local Emmy for on death and dying in America. Because I had grown up on love American style, but you never heard about death American style. We were a death denying culture. And I'm interviewing all of these like 90 year olds that were waiting to die. And I said, is there any advice you have? And they all said, you'll never regret what you did you'll only regret what you didn't do. And then I wanted to make sure that that list was really small by the time I get to the last heartbeat. And so far, so good. Well, I'm so grateful that you are still here and about to Well, learn. thank you. And I am glad that you are keeping the things you didn't get to do list short. <laughs> you were 14, you said, when you got your diagnosis? Yes, I was. I can't imagine what that would be like, um, but I'm curious as to how it felt in your friend circle. It was very difficult for friends to comprehend. Um, I had one dear friend who came to visit 
took one look at me with all the tubes and gizmos and gadgets going on, literally ran out of the room. Like, couldn't deal with it. My father couldn't deal with it. And it's really, I think, the hardest on parents. There is nothing worse than seeing your child suffer. And I actually tried to start, uh, I did a fundraiser uh, uh, when I turned 16 to raise money for counseling for the parents, family, and friends of the patients who were kids because the kids could figure out how to deal with it, actually. And the parents and the, and the friends, they were the wrecks. So I found myself consoling them as opposed to feeling bad for me. And that was kind of interesting. I lost a year in school and I was tutored for a year. And when I got back to school, it was kind of funny that they thought I had died first. Secondly, the rumor went around, they didn't realize what I had. They thought I had something called Tay-Sachs disease. Well, they didn't realize that Tay-Sachs only affects Jewish males under the age of three. And that's what they thought I had. So uh, I was kind of a miracle coming back. The weird thing about it is what we didn't know was back then, the radiation that saved me, that literally got rid of the tumor and allowed me to be in remission and have all these adventures for all these years, they found that all the patients that were about 14 and 15 now have had heart and lung issues that scarred their heart and lungs. And since that time, I have literally have a cow aorta, I have a pig mitral valve, I have a metatronic pacemaker, I have four stents, and they're keeping me alive today. And I'm sort of bionic, I'm really the future, because the next generation of humans are going to be enhanced by medical technology. But what's really interesting is that it's given us longevity. It's, it's what would have been a, a death case you can live an amazing, amazing life. And I'm grateful to medical technology and all these doctors and whatnot have saved me. And, uh, and I'm grateful to the cow. I have no idea every time I eat a burger going, was that you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and similarly, the funny part, um, you know, given my heritage, I'm, I'm not a religious person. I'm a more spiritual person. But, you know, everyone asked me, said, how, how can you get a pig valve? So we, we did call a rabbi to consult, and they asked, you know, well, is it kosher to get a pig valve put in? And the rabbi called back and said, as long as you don't eat it. <laughs> so I'm kosher. <laughs> so that also was a unique experience to re-experience mortality again at middle age and go through the, I'm not going to be here. And again, what it inspired me to do from that and to really want to write more and to make more music, to have a better relationships uh, with family, with my dear love, um, with my dog, <laughs> you know? So I'm a very blessed, very grateful person. You and seem very grateful for all of these experiences. And I get from you that you haven't taken anything about your journey for granted. No. And you've put it to use not only for yourself, but for others. You talk about the inspiration. You talk about, you know, you mentioned the thing about starting the foundation at 16, and all I flashed to was you envisioning being at the top of whatever food chain. Yeah. And so even then, you're starting things where you can control someone else's fate or control an environment to help someone else. I would call it control, but you don't, I think, realize how many people you influence. You've influenced so many people just by doing these interviews and reaching a lot of people. And sometimes you hear about it later and it comes back, and sometimes you don't. I had a very wonderful mentor teacher when I was in high school. And we did theater together and whatnot. And after school, we'd be building sets and whatnot. And he had two beautiful little daughters. And the whole stage crew became their babysitters. And I remember that the daughters, you know, would help us. My mentor died. And I went back for his memorial service. And his daughter came up to me and said, you probably won't remember this, but I just want to tell you what an influence you have been on me, because her father had been such an influence to me. And she said, you won't remember this, but we were backstage, and we were going to move a lighting truss. And she was a little girl. And she went to one end, and I went to the other. She picked it up. And I looked at her, and I just said, you are strong. 
And you know what? She came back and she said, that stayed with me the rest of my life. Anytime I had to deal with something, any problem I faced, I remembered you going, you are strong. And I wouldn't have known this. I wouldn't remember that moment out of all the encounters and moments that we have with each other, but she did. And it stayed with her. And I felt really, you know, very touched. And she, you know, was being strong through her losing her dad. And you don't know how what you say or do will affect someone. And that's why, um, you know, it's interesting, the rules of gossip. We have an industry that's filled with gossip. And gossip is toxic. It's destructive. You know, you go out after work and you talk about someone and, oh, did you hear da 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 And you don't know that that person is not going to interview that person later and not know why they didn't hire them. But something went, you know, oh, I just get a weird feeling. Like you were saying, what's your first impression? Mm -hmm. So there was a, a story that Obama's speechwriter uh, wrote in an interesting book that she wrote about rediscovering her roots and spirituality and she was talking about a rabbi and the rabbi was talking about gossip and the rabbi had heard that there was a guy bad mouthing him in town somebody was saying crap about the rabbi so the rabbi calls him in and says I I heard you were saying not such nice things about me he goes oh so apologetic and he's like what can I do to make it up to you he said well there is something and he said what and he said I want you to go get me your finest goose pillow. Oh, really? And at the time, goose pillows were valuable. And I want you to bring me your goose pillow. And he did. And he says, is that it? No, no. I want you to shake it out. And he shakes it out, and the feathers go all over everywhere. He says, is that okay now, Rabbi? And Rabbi says, no, now I need you to go get them all. <laughs> and that's gossip. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know who's going to get it. And you don't know when it's going to come back to you. And so if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. If I had a dollar for every time my mother told me that growing up. Yeah. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And I talk about that a lot, actually, in these interviews. It comes up often just about how, like you said, with the first impression and just what holds us back even from saying things, not just necessarily from a gossiping standpoint, but the fear of what people will say about you. Oh, you have no idea, do you? Absolutely. And I, that's what I love about doing these interviews and why I love doing this show and having this platform is because you never know what happened before that moment that you encountered somebody that one day, that one chance you yeah. had to meet them. Yep. And it could set the tone for what you thought about them, your perception. You maybe didn't even talk to them. Right. But you made up a story. But now doing this, you get to hear their story, you get to hear where they are every day in their own space, yeah. and make room for them, and maybe see how you connect and how you identify, because even though we're different, we're all a little bit the same. Well, we're all human beings. 100%. You know, we all put pants on, shoes on. You've done so many things, and you've talked about so many things, and you talked about you know, first impressions and, and remembering people. What is something that would surprise people to know about you? I'm looking at my my my, my girlfriend. <laughs> so, so what would you find surprising about me? About you that you have a romantic like a you're very romantic or that you're sensitive. Very sensitive. It might surprise again. people. I don't know, that could. I don't know. I I I'd have a hard time answering it that well, way. Oh, all my male friends are very surprised that I had, you know, because in my business, it's very cut and dry. In business, you really don't want a lot of emotion. It takes, it, there's no need. It, it complicates things. And um, so I guess because of the amount of business you do, and you want the passion to be for the project. And of course, a lot of passion goes into personality interactions. But for the most part, business is, you know, time, money, talent and luck, which I always say are the four things that can solve any problem. If you figure out how to get more time, more money, more talent and luck, you can fix anything. And so that's how I approach most problems. And for the most part, it usually works. Sometimes you just need luck, but money and time and talent don't hurt. What is 
your top three? Because I know if all the things you've done, I could never ask you to name a favorite, I don't think. But what is maybe your top three projects you've worked on, places you've been? Um, well, there are three different areas in that respect because I, I'm a very unique as producers go in that I wasn't the game show guy or the hidden cameras in a house guy or my things were like all over the place. So usually if, if there was a project that was a little different and you couldn't figure out the right producer for it, it was usually me. And so my background, first, my love was music. I, I played keyboards since I could reach them. I had aspirations to be a, a rock star. Um, my looks and talent didn't quite get me to there, but I've had experience like I, I was one and I've played in front of, you know, thousands, but I'm not exactly a rock star. So music motivated me and meeting my musical heroes. So I've worked over through college. I put on concerts, worked over 300 shows with jam productions, which today would be the equivalent of Live Nation or AEG. I worked for AEG. I worked with Bon Jovi for years doing his concert videos, um, not his you know, music videos, but his concert videos. And um, so I've had a lot of experiences that way. And another difference is that um, many producers wind up on a lot in Burbank overlooking the 101. And they're very happy going to the same parking spot with their name on it, same commissary. They bring them the same latte, mochaccino, frappo with their name. You know, and that's their existence day after day after day, and they like that. Mine took me all over the world. Television normally doesn't take you past Burbank, but I got fortunate to do it internationally. And so I was challenged to create a Seinfeld sitcom, but for people who spoke Malay who were Muslim in Singapore. And that was a challenge, to create a comedy writing staff um, in a foreign country in a foreign language. So that was um, you know, a highlight to be able to go and do that and learn a foreign culture um, and, and bring the Hollywood know-how to, to their locale and make it funny for them. Um, all of the vicarious rock star stuff is great. I mean, to be able to sing in Mick Jagger's mic while dancing with a stripper at a private club party show and, and go, rock and roll's never gonna get crazier than this for me. And back then they didn't have cell phones, so I don't have it on video, I wish I did. But the experience of ha 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 honky tonk womaning with Mick is, you know, kill me now. Um, the Chris Angel project was unique because they wanted to create New Dini. And you think about it, you know, when you say top five mag magicians, Houdini, everybody still knows, and this guy's over 100 years old. You know, they might not know anybody now. I mean, David Blaine got kind of famous, but he's more of an endurance guy at this point. So finding someone that really knows magic, and we found that there was a, a hole, there was a spot for a new bad boy Mick Jagger of magic, and Chris Angel, who looked like, you know, at the time, uh, Marilyn Manson's bastard stepkid, um, uh, was there to fill it. But to learn that art form, which they claim is like the second oldest profession, um, the first being prostitution, uh, to learn the secrets behind levitation and vanishing and, and not necessarily be the one to do them in front of the camera, but be the one to set it all up was really an education. And a lot of it's theater. A lot of it went back to my theater training of set design and um, diverge, diversion, um, optical illusion. And that brought out a lot of neat skill sets um, and allowed me to meet a ton of people because we booked a lot of celebrities for that. And I lived and worked out of Las Vegas, which uh, in its own was an experience. I'm from there, I know that. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's its own born and raised. You know, that's a bigger showbiz capital than Hollywood. More curtains at 8 o'clock go up in Las Vegas than Broadway and everywhere else combined. Just as working with an Indian company in Singapore, Bollywood made more films than we do, produced more hours of television than we do. So they're actually the capitals of show business, but we, you know, get all the fame. So... I love your stories, and... I could sit and listen to them forever. And but. <laughs> I, I could. I really could. I, 
And My time is the up. People, the people watching can see you. They can't see me and this crazy grin and the sore cheeks from smiling and laughing <laughs> hearing the story. But I think that my favorite part about this conversation has been your passion and the genuine aura that I feel when you talk about all the things that you've done. And you reference how, you know, in the celebrity world, people want to know the person and claim they know the person. And I just like the way you talk about it and the way that it's just another day and just another person and a human being and, you know, just just the er feelings and, and lifestyle and movement, just like everyone moves about, and, and I love that. Um, I would love to close out our conversation by asking you my final question, which is, as you move about, continuing to do the amazing things that you are working on, that you have worked on, the dreams that you still have with your pig and cow hearts, um, as you are on set, as you are at a fundraiser, in the community, be, if you have the opportunity to hold up a sign that tells people one thing about you, what would you want them to know? Live life fully. <laughs>